All right, let's go to our Sunday school lesson. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. We're going to begin Matthew, chapter 5 today. And as you're turning, I want to call your attention to something. A sister who watches our sermons contacted me and sent me the link to an article. I mentioned water in outer space. Uh, the heavens above the heavens, Psalm 148. And uh, I think I had known about this article, but I had forgotten all about it. And I'm very, very grateful that she uh, sent it to me, and so I printed it out. Caltech-led astronomers discover the largest and most distant reservoir of water yet. Um, Pasadena, California is the date line. That's only about, what's Pasadena, about 20 miles from us here? Not very far. Water really is everywhere. Two teams of astronomers, each led by scientists at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, had discovered the largest and farthest reservoir of water ever detected in the universe. The researchers have found a mass of water vapor that's at least 140 trillion times that of all the water in the world's oceans combined, and 100,000 times more massive than the sun. The environment around this quasar, and they never really define a quasar, at least not sufficiently for this layman, but that's my problem. But uh, environment around this quasar uh, is unique in that it's producing this huge mass of water, says Matt Bradford, a scientist at NASA's uh, JPL. It's another demonstration that water is pervasive throughout the mm -hmm. universe. Did you catch that? Did you catch that last phrase? Because I a couple of coughs when I was saying that really critical sentence there. You know, water is pervasive throughout the universe. Uh, Bradford's team made their observations starting in 2008 using an instrument called the Z-Spec at the Caltech Observatory uh, near the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. A second group, also led by a Caltech scientist, used the Plateau de Bure interferometer in the French Alps to find water. And the article goes on. A lot of technical jargon, which uh, eludes me. But the point is, and I think I mentioned it as we were discussing the uh, probability uh, of water in the universe, because the Word of God says so, that eventually scientists would catch up with the Bible. Uh, the Bible had indicated it centuries ago, and now modern man with his tools and instruments is able to begin detecting it. It's funny how certain things in the natural world, or in this case, that discovered by researchers, uh, continually confirm things that we derive from the scriptures. Do you know the oldest living tree in the world is a bristlecone pine tree right here in California, up in the central part of California, Sierra and so forth. It is said to be approximately 44 to 4,500 years old. They guesstimate its age only based upon the measurements of other trees nearby that, have, that are dead. Of course, they didn't, couldn't cut the living tree down to count its rings or anything like that. You wouldn't want to do that. So they estimate its age based upon the size and the measurements of other dead trees nearby. So that means a couple of things. It means some trees are capable of living thousands of years. Just on its surface, that means that much. Secondly, if there was no flood of Noah, then the world wouldn't have been uh, inundated or saturated with water. So there should be trees older than that one, if trees can live that long. But there aren't any, because about 44 to 4,500 years ago, God flooded the world in the time of Noah. And so after the world was destroyed, birds carrying seeds the way they do, and they fall out of the bird's mouth, and thus trees are, are replanted everywhere they go, these trees began to form and grow 
think about think about this. That tree was here when the Lord Jesus Christ walked on the earth. That tree was here when Israel wandered through the wilderness and has been living ever since then. But you see, men who deny the flood and they want to explain the geology uh, with other ways, by other means, other ways, they can't get around the fact that all around the world, watching these nature shows, you see a light dusting of snow fall upon a mountain peak, and all of a sudden the striations that go horizontal are made very, very clear and plain. Well, all the world around us testifies to the fact that it was all underwater at one time. And as the waters receded and soaked back into the earth, uh, it laid down the sediment and the deposits that we see all around the world. Um, it's funny that they put out the special a few years ago called Planet Earth. And uh, who was the British narrator? Um, uh, Attenborough. But, but he's an agnostic. He's an atheist. And yet you see the... The pictures of the mountains, they have one episode on mountain ranges, and all the striations go this way. <laughs> so they talk about evolution, but the evidence points to creation, at least the story of the Word of God. And uh, that's just the way things go. So, all right, let's go to our lesson. I appreciate that sister sending me that link. And uh, like I say, I think I had known about it, but I had forgotten it, so I'm very, very grateful that she brought it to my attention. And that was nine years ago, 2011, that press release came out. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2 as we get underway. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, or set down, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now what begins here is the famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And it has become nearly infamous by skeptical and unsaved ministers of different stripes who think it's a list of good deeds and good intentions that uh, amount to the plan of salvation today. I want you to keep several things in mind as we get started, and then we'll try to take this on verse by verse as we go. First of all, there are no Christians present at the time. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ had not taken place yet when Christ preached this sermon. There were no New Testament writings available yet. And it was addressed to an entirely Jewish audience at the time. It wasn't even addressed to the apostles because the twelve weren't identified and called out until chapter 10 in Matthew's uh, account, about chapter 10, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, along in there. To apply it doctrinally to a New Testament Christian only reveals someone's uh, ignorance. It really does. Liberals who love the Sermon on the Mount, they don't follow it. Look down at verses 17 through 20. Verses 17 to 20. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say to, unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Maybe the, the Seventh-day Adventists are right, that keeping the law is absolutely necessary. Christ said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. But see, all the liberal and modernist Protestant churches of one sort or another, or the Roman Catholic Church, that all uh, think the Sermon on the Mount is the plan of salvation, which amounts to you doing it as good as you can to get God's attention. 
they don't want to keep the Sabbath. They want to dismiss the Adventists as being too rigid and uh, too strict about keeping dietary laws and so forth. Maybe the Adventists are right. Look at verse 39 also. Verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses are right. You see, they are conscientious objectors. They would call themselves pacifists. They don't take up arms. They don't join the military to defend the country in which they live. Whenever you get to talk to a Jehovah's Witness, here's what, you, here's what I want you to do. Say, tell the Jehovah's Witness, say, listen, let me see if I understand your church's teaching correctly. And you, you tell me if I have it right or not. This is what you want to say to them. As far as I know, you don't pledge allegiance to a flag. You don't enlist in the military because you don't want to run the risk of giving loyalty or defending another kingdom which might be in conflict with Jehovah's kingdom. Is that basically what you believe? And that is the simple explanation. They're going to say yes. And then I want you to point out their hypocrisy. On the back of your money, it says, in God we trust. In, uh, you, you certainly let, you certainly pay your money in taxes to finance that other kingdom. You let that other kingdom and their public schools educate your children. You'll take tax benefits from that other kingdom if you can get away with it. You'll, you'll do any number of things that that kingdom offers you for your benefit, but you don't want to give any loyalty to it or defend it or be proud of it? Point out their hypocrisy. If you were truly opposed to another kingdom, you would be the most anti-income tax religion in the world. You would refuse to pay your taxes because you don't want to support another kingdom. Point out the inconsistency and see what happens. And then when you, when then whatever happens, happens, come back and tell the rest of us. But it's only at Calvary, uh, by the new birth, do you even have the power to live the Sermon on the Mount? And even then, only in a spiritual sense. You can't press it on someone all the way. Go forward to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, and look at verses 8 and 9. Romans 13, verses 8 and 9. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving your neighbor is more important than keeping the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, Paul doesn't even mention it in his list. And he's recapping the, the Ten Commandments right here in Romans 13. So, in effect, ignore the Sabbath. What's more important is for you to have love for your neighbor, your fellow man. Uh, to correctly understand the Bible, to correctly understand the Sermon on the Mount, all that's necessary is for you to believe everything that God has said in his word up to this point. God had promised Israel a king and a kingdom. Look back at chapter 2, Matthew 2, and verse 6. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And that's um, Matthew paraphrasing from Micah 5, verse 2, which I mentioned in church hour. And chapter 3, Matthew 3, verse 2. 
John the Baptist saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king, or the ruler, has appeared. And now he sits and uh, delivers the constitution of that kingdom to his followers. And it will be a literal, physical, messianic um, rule over a Jewish kingdom here on the earth. Verse 3, as we get started here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice, first of all, that the subject of the sermon is not heaven, but the kingdom of heaven. That's not the same thing. No one's soul is being forgiven. No one's soul is being saved through some penitence, hoping to achieve something or to receive some reward for uh, being sorry for their sin, um, it stands to reason that you're past that. If you're in the kingdom, you've already gotten past that qualification stage. Um, not just poor, but poor in spirit is the wording. Spiritually speaking, for our sake, go back, if you will, to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, and notice there verse 18. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Also look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and verse 17 there. Psalm 51. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Not a false humility, but a genuine humility that makes up your entire demeanor between you and God, between you and the Messiah one day. Verse 4 in our text. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Once again, it's, it's futile to apply this doctrinally to a church-age believer. A lot of people mourn and uh, are never comforted, especially if they know that their loved one who has died was not a believer. They went into eternity without Jesus Christ and are most likely burning in hell now. That's a hard thing to come to grips with. Hard thing to admit. And it's probably true for every person in this room that someone we knew, someone who we loved, left this world and was not a true believer in Jesus Christ. They were never born again. And if the word of God is true, and you and I believe it, that person is in hell. The very thought of it makes you want to break out in tears because had things been different, had an opportunity been given, had someone witnessed to them more thoroughly, perhaps they would have turned to Jesus Christ. We can't go back in time and change those things now. But some people mourn and never do receive the comfort that they need from God, that they want from God. But look, if you will, at Matthew chapter 9. Go forward, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, notice here, Verse 15, Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber, uh, excuse me, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they 
fast. Look also at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 30. Actually, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, verse 30, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Also go forward to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We're just getting our feet wet in chapter 5 this morning, so we won't be lengthy here. James chapter 4, and verses 8 and 9. James 4, verses 8 and 9. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. He says in verse 8, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. That sounds an awful lot like faith and works. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart, ye double-minded. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when someone says everyone's saved in all ages the same way, they're an idiot. They have no idea how to approach the word of God or handle handle or how to rightly divide it. And they're told to do so, 2 Timothy 2.15. I want you to go back, if you will, to, well, first of all, go forward to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And notice there, Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. The woman is going to be Israel in the book of Revelation and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, as the Antichrist hunting down the Jew, which keep the commandments of God, works, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, faith. Look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, works, and the faith of Jesus, faith. Now go back to the book of Psalms, Psalm 21. Actually, I think, make it Psalm 24. Psalm 24. It says in verse 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those are good questions. Who is going to be qualified to approach the Lord when he sits on his throne? Verse 4, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Clean hands and a pure heart. Look back at Psalm 21. Psalm 21, and we'll finish for today. I'm just giving you a taste, giving you a few things to think about. Psalm 21. Uh, verse, uh, verse 7. For the king... Trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. 
Well, that king is going to be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Verse 8. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them, those that hate them, as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. The plan of salvation in the tribulation will be to will be faith plus works coupled together. How much faith and how much works none of us can say for sure. But don't worry about it. We're not going to be here when the time comes. And also worshiping God as the creator, the one who made heaven and earth, and just dismiss any suggestion of evolution or Charles Darwin, any other modern theory that rejects God. And helping the Jew during his greatest time of persecution, being hunted down by the man of sin. It will not be by grace through faith plus nothing. That time will have passed. You hear people ask the question, and there are a lot of ministers on the internet who want to speculate whether the church will go through the tribulation or will they or will they not go through the tribulation? Well, if the church goes through the tribulation, then there is no tribulation. It's effectively still the church age. If the church is still here, answer the question that way. If the church is still here, then it's still the church age. You can't say, well, I'm saved by grace through faith and I'm kept saved until I get to a certain point in time and then now my salvation depends upon me working for it and avoiding the mark of the beast and helping the Jew uh, keeping the commandments and all the other things. No. That'll be an entirely different dispensation of faith and works because you've just come out of a, a, the church age where salvation was entirely by grace through faith preceded by an age where salvation was dependent upon works. So the next one will logically be a combination of the two. You'd think it would be crystal clear for someone uh, who reads it on the page of the Bible and put those things together. But you see, when you don't believe in a perfect Bible, then you don't have 100% confidence in the words on the page and the arrangement of the words and the sentences uh, exactly as you see them. And you think it's just sort of a loose, uh, take it or leave it and just change it from time to time. Do you realize from 1900 until about the year 2000, in that 100 year span, there were at least 70 different English translations produced and launched onto the market. You can't say that the English language uh, becomes antiquated and went out of date every 13, 14 months. And you needed a new Bible. And they all advertised themselves the same way, finally making the Word of God clear and putting into the common man's language. Wait, the 65 versions before that, they all said the same thing, finally making it clear, finally making it clear. It's amazing how you can look through the list of all the translations. It's amazing how many of them have the word new on the title. The new English version, the new international version, the new King James Version, the new American Standard Version, the new Revised Standard Version, the new NIV, the new Jerusalem Bible, the new World Translation. Everything's new. New, 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 new. Everything's new, but none of it's improved. <laughs>